So greetings and welcome to outside the class. Um, this way doing things, um, we can watch the videos that we will be discussing before we start chatting. I hope to keep these to around 15 minutes or so. Uh, easy to catch and even easier to catch up on. So uh, today and outside the class, we're going to continue on our Matthew series that, that we've been on. We're on episode 18. This will be the only one on 18. Uh, one Way to the Grave. Interesting title. I don't think we're going to get there quite with that, but One of the Grave with Tim Mackey. And don't forget, in the description below are links to all the audio, video, and source documents that we use here in the Dusty Feet. We want to make sure that any material we use here is properly credited to those folks who work so hard to bring it to us. Without their efforts, the learning we do here does not happen. So be sure to click to subscribe, hit that bell icon for a reminder. And as always on the Dusty Feet, this is a place where we can safely explore the endless ways of God, interconnection of His creation, where belief understandings may be challenged, divine misunderstandings may exist, and traditional teachings might falter as we pursue connection, context, and community with God and each other here in an environment of grace and love. So here we go with some more outside the class on the dusty feet. Okay, and as always, it is expected that you watch the reference videos first. So you get a context for the, the, the discussion, right? And to hear the perspective of the originator. In this case, Tim Mackey. And if you have not watched it before, then I will acknowledge this, that in this episode, and actually episode 36 as well, interesting 18 and 36, right? Are audio only. Um, you know, I assume for some reason that the video recording just didn't work, but the audio did. So just be prepared that it will be only the slide of Matthew with Tim speaking. I still find him compellingly engaging. So if you have not yet, pause this, click on the link in the description. When you come back, we can chat. So, and, and, and we're back, right? So this is going to be one of those upside down episodes. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly certain it's going to divide the room. Uh, it will cause some to look closer at these words and will call, cause others to probably just look away. But that's expected. It was the same then. And it's going to do the same today. You know, I, I like that Tim mentions that there are uncomfortable issues, right, that Jesus talked about. Things that really give us uh, pause, right? make us think. And this, for sure, uh, is, is definitely w one of them. Uh, Tim gives a good a summary of what Matthew has uh, presented to us so far in his Gospel account. And by the time we get to chapters 11 and 12, we are now given a number of responses to what Jesus has been sharing um, up to now. So, um, so let's remember that we've been talking a bit about where these folks are at in understanding um, that they are struggling with, one, to grasp that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. And two, uh, that they have a paradigm, uh, at least a paradigm lens, of expectation about that Messiah. That is important to keep in mind, since even his closest followers are struggling with the exact same thing, right? We see that in their responses time and time again. So this, in, in Matthew's account anyways, 
are the first real warnings of Jesus, right? Uh, Matthew is sharing a new facet of the Messiah. Like Tim said, uh, we like the Jesus so far, but now we get to a sticky part. Uh, we love the love part of Yeshua, but are not so thrilled with the judgment part of this Messiah, right? Um, we probably unintentionally seem to make the point that he is talking about them. It is certainly, it's certainly not about me, right? He is referring to those other people. And of course, it's not about us in any way. Hmm. So I decided to do a little context digging on two related words, right? Sheol and Hades. Interesting findings, I thought, anyways. So Sheol is mentioned 67 times in the Hebrew Bible, 67 times in the Brit, the New Testament, zero. Hades is mentioned in Scripture 10 times in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, zero. In the Brit, the New Testament, 10. Are you surprised by that? You know, it's not really shocking since one word is Hebrew and the other is Greek. But now Tim mentions that the actual base meaning of Hades is a place of the dead, right? Not surprisingly enough, Sheol happens to have the same contextual meaning as in a place of the dead. What we do have <laughs> It's a paradigm of 2,000 plus years of Hades and what pictures that conjures up, what the paradigm of Hades has become, especially post Dante. Hades is the Greek god of the lower regions. It seems we can really get confused here. So that might be something to ponder, something to think about um, when the scriptures talk about uh, when they talk about these things and what we then add to our paradigms, what things have been added to our paradigms, right? So we have something um, that Jesus does very much that Tim brings up, is that uh, he's a prophet, right? And at times, he very much speaks like a prophet. You know, many prophets made declarations to communities and to the nation of Israel, right? to change their behavior or bear the consequences, right? Heck, even Jonah was supposed to deliver a proclamation to the city of Nineveh, and he tried to get out of it by running away. Repent. You know, I love that Tim brings up that our English word for um, repent, it, the Hebrew is teshuva and the Greek word metaneo. You know, both the Greek and the word, a Hebrew, again, mean almost the same thing, to change one's mind or purpose, right? Uh, the Hebrew word implies a change of direction, right? Because Hebrew is a very visceral, visual word. You know, it seems that in just reading this section, that we have two major paradigms that have baggage attached. Years of teachings that support uh, a viewing of each, and both heavily church, uh, they have heavy imposed church implications, right? So this is an upside down thought in a way. If you were them, please keep in mind in your head that we talk about here that we are them and they are us. And Jesus is talking about them and their towns being judged. Jesus is talking about judging them. But hey, they're the ones being occupied. They're the ones being oppressed by the Romans. There is no talk about what Jesus is going to do to Rome. No judgment to Rome. So how do you think that might affect a few folks? Especially if you have the expectation that the Messiah is supposed to rescue you from the oppressors. Remember that he will eventually. Um, that's just on the second visit, the Messiah Ben David role. Yet for now, this is what they hear. So now, can you begin to maybe a little understand this confusion and such? This is not what they expected to hear. 
And then Tim mentioned the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, you can't get really more upside down than that, really. Um, lessers, greater, gentle, sell, inherit, merciful, peacemakers. These are not the words, quite possibly, that they were expecting to hear. They're good words and true words. The future king is speaking, and this will be his kingdom, right? Just to make it a little messier, a little muddier, this is the time we are in. The words that Jesus, that Yeshua, is setting forth are words to us. Now I'm back around to we are them and they are us. We don't seem to like those words either. We want to fight back condemn Rome. So now you have an idea where I might be going with this. Maybe we are those like them that we want to fight back Rome. We want to bring justice to Rome. But it seems Jesus is facing a different way. This prophet-like judgment, just like the prophets of old, they are facing Israel. They are facing towards the people of God. And again, we are them, and they are us, because we are the people of God. Maybe we need to put our own house in order first. And that's what Jesus seems to be saying here. They're uncomfortable words, yet if we really do pay attention to the stories in Scripture, the story's the same. Choose life, not death. Change our ways. Repent. Choose the words of life to guide our ways. To be the example for the rest of the nations, right? So what if, what if God, and remember, this is a huge and fantastical what if, but what if God said, look at the example of my people. This is what the rest of the nation should be behaving like. If the words of the Father and the Son were followed, would that be the example? And then the king returns and says, didn't you see, nations, didn't you see that example? But now the scary answer is, what do they, the nations, see? Are we the example? That's again another thought that terrifies me. Our splintered, broken body that we have now, right? That, that is just a witness. It's a testimony to a struggling truth that we seem to be missing something. You know, what's the difference between uh, knowing God, figuring out God, or even agreeing with God and choosing to follow Him? You know, rest. Define rest. How do you view rest? Burden. You know, Jesus never said no burden. It's never was going to be hard or change free, but that his burden is lighter. Now, I loved the analogy that Tim uses about the burden and how Tim views a shift of mode on how to carry that burden. And then there's one point I might add to that. As Tim mentioned, uh, that one transfers the burden from the bag on our shoulders uh, to the cart, and then using a yoke to pull that cart. You know, I thought of um, Tevia in the uh, Fiddler on the Roof, and when his horse comes up lame, he has to then take the yoke, the rope yoke, and he pulls the cart. But you can look back and see he can't possibly carry everything that's behind him. But it's still his responsibility. It's still, I'll argue, his burden. But he's got the yoke and he's pulling it. And that was the picture that pulls up in my head, right? But now, um, but that, with that yoke, it helps um, spread out and balance the strain, right? He, he's not carrying all those in his arms. He's now just pulling on this piece, right? Maybe, just maybe, I'll add this. Um, and I love this analogy. I, I really, really do. 
how much easier is it for someone else to help us with a burden, or we with them, to connect themselves to us and then to our cart, and we can pull together. See the picture? Different picture. We have a lot of upside down here. Things we find uncomfortable, things we don't want to do. So let's keep that in mind as we um, read through these uncomfortable points in it and remember that he's talking about the people going forward on there, that we are them and they are us. So here's a point to ponder, and unusual um, person to speak it is Anne McCaffrey. But I really liked this quote from her. Make no judgments where you have no compassion. Make no judgments where you have no compassion. Good point, Anne. And thanks for being with us today on Outside the Class with the Dusty Feet.